Upon an eroded cliff top rested the man, gazing far across the valley. Lying thus, he could see a great distance, but in all the sere expanse, there was no visible motion. Nothing stirred the dusty plain, the disintegrating sand of long dry riverbeds, where once coursed the gushing streams of Earth's youth. There was little greenery in this ultimate world, this final stage of mankind's prolonged presence upon the planet. For unnumbered aeons, the drought and sandstorms had ravaged all the lands. The trees and bushes had given way to small, twisted shrubs that persisted long through their sturdiness. But these, in turn, perished before the onslaught of coarse grasses and stringy, tough vegetation of strange evolution. The ever-present heat as Earth drew nearer to the sun, withered and killed with pitiless rays. It had not come at once. Long aeons had gone before any could feel the change. And all through those first ages, man's adaptable form had followed the slow mutation and modeled itself to fit the more and more torrid air. Then the day had come when men could bear their hot cities but ill and a gradual recession began. Slow, yet deliberate, those towns and settlements closest to the equator had been first. Of course, but later, there were others. Man, softened and exhausted, could cope no longer with the ruthlessly mounting heat. It seared him as he was, and evolution was too low to mold new resistances in him. Yet not at first were the great cities of the equator left to the spider and the scorpion. In the early years, there were many who stayed on, devising curious shields and armors against the heat and the deadly dryness. These fearless souls, screening certain buildings against the encroaching sun, made miniature worlds of refuge wherein no protective armor was needed. They contrived marvelously ingenious things so that for a while men persisted in the rusting towers, hoping thereby to cling to old lands till the searing should be over. For many would not believe what the astronomer said, and looked for a coming of the mild olden world again. But one day, the men of Dath, from the new city of Nyara, made signals to Uenario their immemorably ancient capital, and gained no answer from the few who remained therein. And when explorers reached that millennial city of bridge-linked towers, they found only silence. There was not even the horror of corruption, for the scavenger lizards had been swift. Only then did the people fully realize that these cities were lost to them know that they must forever abandon them to nature. The other colonists in the hot lands fled from their brave posts, and total silence reigned within the high basalt walls of a thousand empty towns. Of the dense throngs and multitudinous activities of the past, nothing finally remained. There now loomed against the rainless deserts only the blistered towers of vacant houses, factories and structures of every sort, reflecting the sun's dazzling radiance and parching in the more and more intolerable heat. Many lands, however, had still escaped the scorching blight, so that the refugees were soon absorbed in the life of a newer world. During strangely prosperous centuries, the deserted cities of the equator grew half-forgotten and entwined with fantastic fables. Few thought of those spectral rotting towers, those huddles of shabby walls and cactus-choked streets, darkly silent and abandoned. Wars came, sinful and prolonged, but the times of peace were greater 
yet always the swollen sun increased its radiance as Earth drew closer to its fiery parent. It was as if the planet meant to return to that source whence it was snatched aeons ago through the accident of cosmic growth. After a time, the blight crept outward from the central belt. Southern Yeret burned as a tenantless desert, and then the north, in Perith and Balling, those ancient cities where brooding centuries dwelt. There moved only the scaly shapes of the serpent and the salamander, and at last, Lotan echoed only to the fitful falling of tottering spires and crumbling domes, steady, universal, and inexorable was the great eviction of man from the realms he had always known. No land within the widening, stricken belt was spared. No people left unrouted. It was an epic, a titan tragedy whose plot was unrevealed to the actors. This wholesale desertion of the cities of men. It took not years or even centuries, but millennia of ruthless change. And still, it kept on. Sullen. Inevitable. Savagely devastating. Agriculture was at a standstill. The world fast became too arid for crops. This was remedied by artificial substitutes, soon universally used, and as the old places that had known the great things of mortals were left, the loot salvaged by the fugitives grew smaller and smaller. Things of the greatest value and importance were left in dead museums, lost amid the centuries, and in the end, the heritage of the immemorable past was abandoned. A degeneracy both physical and cultural set in with the insidious heat. For man had so long dwelt in comfort and security that his exodus from past scenes was difficult. Nor were these events received phlegmatically. Their slowness was terrifying. Degradation and debauchery were soon common. Government was disorganized, and the civilization steadily slid back towards barbarism. When 49 centuries after the blight from the equatorial belt, the whole western hemisphere was left unpeopled. Chaos was complete. There was no trace of order or decency in the last scenes of this titanic, wildly impressive migration. Madness and frenzy stalked through them, and fanatics screamed of an Armageddon close at hand. Mankind was now a pitiful remnant of the elder race, a fugitive not only from the prevailing conditions, but from his own degeneracy. Into the Northland, in the Antarctic, went those who could. The rest lingered for years in an incredible Saturnalia, vaguely doubting the forthcoming disasters. In the city of Borligo, a wholesale execution of the new prophets took place. After months of unfulfilled expectations, they thought the flight to the Northland unnecessary, and looked no longer for the threatened ending. How they perish must have been terrible indeed. Those vain, foolish creatures who thought to defy the universe. But the blackened, scorched towns are mute. These events, however, must not be chronicled. For there are larger things to consider than this complex and unhastening downfall of a lost civilization. During a long period, morale was at lowest ebb among the courageous few who settled upon the alien Arctic and Antarctic shores, now mild as those of the southern Yaret in the long dead past. But here there was respite. The soil was fertile, 
and forgotten pastoral arts were called into use anew. There was, for a long time, a contented little epitome of the lost lands, though here were no vast throngs or great buildings, only a sparse remnant of humanity survived the aeons of change and peopled those scattered villages of the later world. How many millennia this continued is not known. The sun was slow in invading the last retreat, and as the eras passed, there developed a sound, sturdy race, bearing no memories or legends of the old, lost lands. Little navigation was practiced by this new people, and the flying machine was wholly forgotten. Their devices were of the simplest type, and their culture was simple and primitive. Yet they were contented, and accepted the warm climate as something natural and accustomed. But unknown to these simple peasant folk, still further rigors of nature were slowly preparing themselves. As the generations passed, the waters of the vast and unplumbed ocean wasted slowly away enriching the air and the desiccated soil, but sinking lower and lower each century. The splashing surf still glistened bright, and the swirling eddies were still there, but a doom of dryness hung over the whole watery expanse. However, the shrinkage could not have been detected, save by instruments more delicate than any then known to the race. Even had the people realized the ocean's contraction, it is not likely that any vast alarm or great disturbance would have resulted, for the losses were so slight and the seas so great, only a few inches during many centuries, but in many centuries, increasing. So at last, the oceans went and the water became a rarity on a globe of sun-baked drought. Man had slowly spread over all the Arctic and Antarctic lands, the equatorial cities and many of the later habitations were forgotten, even to legend. And now again, the peace was disturbed, for water was scarce and found only in deep caverns. There was little enough even of this, and men died of thirst wandering in far places. Yet so slow were these deadly changes that each new generation of man was loath to believe what it had heard from its parents. None would admit that the heat had been less or the water more plentiful in the old days, or take warning that days of bitterer burning and drought were to come. Thus, it was even at the end when only a few hundred human creatures panted for breach beneath the cruel sun, a piteous huddled handful out of all the unnumbered millions who had once dwelt on the doomed planet. And the hundreds became small, till man was to be reckoned only in tens. These tens clung to the shrinking dampness of the caves and knew at last that the end was near. So slight was their range that none had ever seen the tiny, fabled spots of ice left close to the planet's poles, if such indeed remained. Even had they existed and been known to man, none could have reached them across the trackless and formidable deserts. And so, the last pathetic few dwindled. It cannot be described this awesome chain of events that depopulated the whole earth. The range is too tremendous for any to picture or encompass. Of the people of earth's fortunate ages, billions of years before, only a few prophets and madmen could have conceived that which was to come, could have grasped visions of the still dead lands and long empty seabeds. The rest would have doubted, 
doubted alike the shadow of change upon the planet and the shadow of doom upon the race. For man has always thought himself the immortal master of natural things. When he had eased the dying pangs of the old woman, Yul wandered in a fearful daze out into the dazzling sands. She had been a fearsome thing, shriveled and so dry, like withered leaves. Her face had been the color of the sickly yellow grasses that rustled in the hot wind, and she was loathsomely old. But she had been a companion, someone to stammer out vague fears to, to talk to about this incredible thing, a comrade to share one's hopes for, secure from those silent other colonies beyond the mountains. He could not believe none lived elsewhere, for Yule was young and not certain as are the old. For many years he had known none but the old woman. Her name was Maladna. She had come that day in his eleventh year, when all the hunters went to seek food and did not return. Yul had no mother that he could remember, and there were few women in the tiny group. When the men vanished, those three women, the young one and the two old, had screamed fearfully and moaned long. Then the young one had gone mad and killed herself with a sharp stick. The old ones buried her in a shallow hole dug with their nails, so Yule had been alone when the still old Maladna came. She walked with the aid of a knotty pole, a priceless relic of the old forest, hard and shiny with years of use. She did not say whence she came, but stumbled into the cabin while the young suicide was being buried. There she waited till the two returned, and they accepted her incuriously. That was the way it had been for many weeks, until the two fell sick, and Maladna could not cure them. Strange that those younger two should have been stricken while she, infirm and ancient, lived on. Maladna had cared for them many days, and at length they died, so that Yule was left only with a stranger. He screamed all the night, so she became, at length, out of patience, and threatened to die too. Then, hearkening, he became quiet at once, for she was not desirous of complete solitude. After that he lived with Maladna, and they gathered roots to eat. Maladna's rotten teeth were ill-suited for the food they gathered, but they contrived to chop it up till she could manage it. This weary routine of seeking and eating was Yule's childhood. Now he was strong and firm in his nineteenth year, and the old woman was dead. There was naught to stay for, so he determined at once to seek out those fabled huts beyond the mountains and live with the people there. There was nothing to take on the journey. Yule closed the door to his cabin. Why, he could not have told for no animals had been there for many years, and left the dead woman within. Half-dazed and fearful at his own audacity, he walked long hours in the dry grasses, and at length reached the first of the foothills. The afternoon came, and he climbed until he was weary, and lay down on the grasses, sprawled there. He thought of many things, he wondered at the strange life, passionately anxious to seek out the lost colony beyond the mountains. But at last, he slept. When he awoke, there was starlight on his face, and he felt refreshed, now that the sun was gone for a time. He traveled more quickly, eating little and determining to hasten before the lack of water became difficult to bear. 
he had brought none. For the last people, dwelling in one place and never having occasion to bear their precious water away, made no vessels of any kind. Yule hoped to reach his goal within a day, and thus escape thirst. So we hurried on beneath the bright stars, running at times in the warm air, and at other times lapsing into a dog trot. So he continued until the sun arose, yet still he was within the small hills, with three great peaks looming ahead. In their shade he rested again, then he climbed all the morning, and at midday surmounted the first peak, where he lay for a time, surveying the space before the next range. Upon an eroded cliff top rested the man, gazing far across the valley, lying thus he could see a great distance, but on all the sere expanse, there was no visible motion. The second night came, and found Yule amid the rough peaks, the valley and the place where he had rested far behind. He was nearly out of the second range now, and hurrying still. Thirst had come upon him that day, and he regretted his folly, yet he could not have stayed there with the corpse. Alone in the grassland, he sought to convince himself thus, and hastened ever on, tiredly straining. And now there were only a few steps before the cliff wall would part and allow a view of the land beyond. Yule stumbled warily down the stony way, tumbling and bruising himself even more. It was nearly before him, this land where men were rumored to have dwelt, this land of which he had heard tales in his youth. The way was long, but the goal was great. A boulder of giant circumference cut off his view. Upon this he scrambled anxiously. Now, at last, he could behold, by the sinking orb, his long-sought destination, and his thirst and aching muscles were forgotten, as he saw joyfully that a small huddle of buildings clung to the base of the farther cliff. Yule rested not, but spurred on by what he saw, ran and staggered and crawled the half-mile remaining. He fancied that he could detect forms among the rude cabins. The sun was nearly gone, the hateful, devastating sun that had slain humanity. He could not be sure of details, but soon the cabins were near. They were very old, for clay blocks lasted long in the still dryness of the dying world. Little indeed changed, but the living things, the grasses, and these last men. Before him, an open door swung on rude pegs. In the fading light, Yule entered, weary unto death, seeking painfully the expected faces. Then he fell upon the floor and wept, for at the table was propped a dry and ancient skeleton. He rose at last, crazed by thirst, aching unbearably, and suffering the greatest disappointment any mortal could know. He was, then, the last living thing upon the globe, his the heritage of the earth, all the lands, and all to him equally useless. He staggered up not looking at the dim white form in the reflected moonlight, and went through the door. About the empty village he wandered, spectrally preserved by the changeless air. Here there was a dwelling, there a rude place where things had been made, clay vessels holding only dust, and nowhere any liquid to quench his burning thirst. 
Then, in the center of the little town, Yule saw a well curb. He knew what it was, for he had heard tales of such things from Maladna. With pitiful joy, he reeled forward and leaned upon the edge. There, at last, was the end of his search. Water. Slimy, stagnant, and shallow. But water, before his sight. Yul cried out the voice of a tortured animal, groping for the chain and bucket. His hand slipped on the slimy edge, and he fell upon his chest across the brink. For a moment, he lay there, and soundlessly his body was precipitated down the black shaft. There was a slight splash in the murky shallowness as he struck some long sunken stone, dislodged aeons ago from the massive coping. The disturbed water subsided into quietness. And now, at last, the earth was dead. The final, pitiful survivor had perished. All the teeming billions, the slow aeons, the empires and civilizations of mankind, were summed up in his poor twisted form. And how titanically meaningless it had all been. Now indeed had come an end and climax to all the efforts of humanity. How monstrous and incredible a climax in the eyes of those poor complacent fools in the prosperous days. Not ever again would the planet know the thunderous tramping of human millions or even the crawling of lizards and the buzz of insects, for they too had gone. Now was come the rain of shapeless branches and endless fields of tough grasses. Earth, like its cold imperturbable moon, was given over to silence and blackness forever. The stars whirled on, the whole careless plan would continue for infinities unknown. This trivial end of a negligible episode mattered not to distant nebula or to suns newborn, flourishing and dying. The race of man, too puny and momentary to have a real function or purpose, was as if it had never existed. To such a conclusion, the aeons of its farcically toilsome evolution had led. But when the deadly sun's first rays darted across the valley, a light found its way to the weary face of a broken figure that lay in the slime. <laughs>